it's very important that we look at alternative ways that we produce protein. At the moment, we are really at the limits of our system. We expect that there's 50% more protein needed by 2050. So the way that we do this right now, we will not have a planet to sit on to eat our protein. So we really need alternatives and biotechnology, so using microorganisms, is a very efficient way because you can do it in, in a bioreactor, so it's a closed system. So you really create protein out of not protein. This is very efficient and you have a lot less land use, you have a lot less emissions. Protein is critical to a healthy diet, but producing meat is a lengthy and inefficient process. Add that to consumer concerns around health, cruelty, and environmental impact, and you get increasing demand for protein alternatives. Microharvest is one of a handful of early stage companies trying to meet that demand with one of the world's fastest protein production processes yet. So I'm Kate Bakers and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Microharvest. We focus on the production of alternative protein as a substitute for animal-based protein. We always say we unleash protein from nature. The nature that we use are microorganisms. The bacteria that you know from your food, from your yogurt or your kimchi, they are now used in food to make your food more tasteful or uh, give it more structure. These uh, bacteria, these are tiny, very efficient protein production factories. So like any other fermentation, it starts here with a very small amount of microorganisms that grow exponentially to large amounts. Uh, however, what is specific for this fermentation process, then unlike other ones which take days and weeks, we can do everything within a single day, not only including the fermentation, but all the downstream processing and finally getting from the small amount of bacteria here to bags and tons of protein. And of course everybody wants to know how it tastes. It has a bit of a savory taste. Some people call it a bit cereal. I think the great thing about it is that it doesn't have an aftertaste. So we'll use them and sell them as an ingredient to be incorporated in food or in pet food or in feed. Using all natural bacteria that you know are already linked to the bacteria that we eat today, it's actually a very normal and logical way to move into that direction. And then if you see all the benefits that you have on, on sustainability impact, on efficiency, they're really enthusiastic uh, about this. So it's also about the efficiency of how you produce. If you think of a production site, which is one soccer field big in size, the amount of protein that we can produce there in one day is the same amount of protein that you produce when you grow 200 chickens and you need a couple of weeks for that. So if we produce for one month on this soccer field, the amount of protein that we produce is the same amount as if you would produce soy for 31 years. And if we produce for one year, we produce the same amount of protein as you would have if you pr would produce 1.2 million sardines. And this is also why we really focus on this B2B ingredient space. Because if you produce alternative proteins and you produce your final burger or your final cheese, what you can do, you can start in a local supermarket or a local restaurant and then you go to the next restaurant and then maybe a city, the next city, a country, the next country. So you can scale up your production step by step. So anything we do here will be able to scale to this large plant because this is our core focus in the lab. Microharvest aims to sell the powder as a protein booster to factories manufacturing aquatic feed and pet fare before expanding its offering to suppliers of human-grade food. But none of that can happen until the company proves its scalability and clears regulatory hurdles. We use microbes that are all natural, but they haven't been used in the past in that way. So they need to go through a regulatory approval process, of course, because we need to make sure that whatever we put into food, that it's safe for, for people to eat. But this is a very lengthy process, I think a bit more lengthy than it should be. If I think about the future of microharvest, I don't want to think about five years, 10 years, I want to think like next year, the year after, right? So that we really already become a player in the market in a relatively short period. And I think this is something that's very important because everybody thinks about well, 2050, but if you see today outside what's happening in the world on climate change, it's really necessary to drive change today.